Thank you very much for talking to us, Aida. What have you been up to? A lot of things. It has been a rather difficult year, most of it. Come January 3rd, that's when Fidel passed on. And then everything else just went haywire, just changed. But uh, I hope things will turn out better. Let's talk about Fidel, Aida, and the type of child he was. Fidel is our firstborn. And uh, when he was born, he was a bumpy, big baby. I could tell from birth that he was going to be really long, or tall, for that matter. And uh, <coughs> he was a lone child for a, a little bit, four and a half years before Rosemary came in. And he was a very cheerful baby, very nice. And he grew up to a, a loving young man, and uh, very playful but always reserved in a way, in one way or another. And uh, he was a loving child. Mm. Now, <coughs> you know, um, when Fidel turned nine, I think there was also tragedy again in our lifestyle, because that's the time when the father, that was 1982, when the father was arrested, charged with treason, and then later on detained. So for six and a half years, from 1982 way to 1988 February uh, they were the father was not there and I brought up these children alone and uh, by the time the father came up he had turned into a teenager so most of the formative years of Fidel for example it was with me and uh, not necessarily the father. When the father finally came out after those detentions, uh, Fidel was uh, 17, approaching 18. And of course they started rebounding again. And soon after that, after one year, only one year, he went to the university and left the country. Mm -hmm. And he stayed away for quite some years. Would you say that because you were with him as a mother more than his father was, that he was closer to you? He was very close to me because, probably because I was the one available at that particular time. But I realized that when he came back from U.S. and settled back in Kenya, he was always very close to the father also. Because those who know Fidel well and who saw him knew that he used to accompany his father into many, many places be it the meetings or rallies or whatever functions, Fidel would always accompany his father. Mm -hmm. But that did not stop him from loving me because I think Fidel loved him very dearly. Mm -hmm. I want to take you back to how you received news um, of his demise and under what circumstances um, he met his death. The morning of 4th, to the Sunday morning, I woke up around 4 o'clock, 4 a.m. and something just told me I have to pray for Fidel. So I prayed, then I said, why, why Fidel? I should, you know, said I should pray for everybody. So that's the time I knew I hold my devotion. So I prayed for everybody, and again, I prayed again for Fidel. Then I read some, some verses in the Bible, then I fell asleep again. Mm -hmm. And I woke up at around 7 o'clock, 7.15, and Rosemary, who was at home here, called me. I could tell from her voice that she was agitated or she was very serious. She asked me, Mom, are you, where are you? And I said, um, I'm in the house. Uh, uh, where, where in the house? I said, I'm in Karen. Then she asked, are you with Dad? I said, yes. Is Dad near you? I said, yes, what is it? That Mom has just called me. Luam now is Fidel's wife mm. and she's crying and she's saying that Fidel is not breathing. <sighs> when I heard that, I got up, I told my husband, Fidel is dead. Yeah, I screamed, I think I screamed and he asked me what and I said, Fidel is dead. He said, what? How? Where? Then I said, he's in the house, let's go. Mm. Now. When we got there, uh, at Fidel's place, they just saw us at the gate and they opened the gate. And in the compound I found, I saw the ambulance, the engine was on. 
and but there was nobody in the car so I just went upstairs and when we got, got there we found these para, paramedics mm -hmm. the people who handled the, the ambulance and uh, <coughs> they were trying to resuscitate him hmm? they kept on hmm? pumping the chest to resuscitate him yeah I got closer and I touched the feet but I could see the feet were pale Huh? pale a bit yellowish huh? and I could tell that there was no blood flowing on those feet huh? mm -hmm. and I kept on watching as they struggled then after a while I had a lot of hopes because we were just standing there with my husband and then they told us call the call the doctor or call a family doctor is there a doctor you can call and for a moment, I could not figure out which doctor to call or who to call. Uh, I think I was in state also of confusion. Of course, after a short while, there was there were many doctors who came, and uh, these people said, turned round after they tried for some time. They turned round to my husband and they said, "I'm sorry." We have lost him. At that point, I knew the letter was gone. And the nation uh, proceeded to mourn with your family, and the question was, what happened to Fidel? And that is the question that people continue to ask until today. Was the cause of his death uh, determined? To be, um, were those answers given to you as a family? At that particular time, mm -hmm. we did not know the cause of the death. But still, we don't know exactly what caused Fidel's death. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that is what makes Fidel's, Fidel's death painful. Mm -hmm. They are still carrying out investigations. But I know one day, sooner or later, we'll know what caused Fidel's death. Mm. We saw the other day you tweeting um, on his birthday. Um, as a family, what are you doing to keep his spirit alive? I remember Fidel every day. Every day, all the time. I still pray for his soul. Uh, we do things that remind us of Fidel. The other day, on the 2nd of, Feb of, of November, that was his birthday. So I just decided to write a letter to Fidel. Fidel Castro Odiambo Odinga, Obangi Wodinya game. 42 years ago today was the happiest day of my life. God had just blessed us with a bouncing baby boy. Today is the first time we celebrate your birthday without you being physically present but we are ably represented by your son Alai, who is a mirror image of you and your wife Luam. Fondly missed by dad, your sisters Rosie and Winnie, your brother Raila Jr. and Yvonne, your nieces Safi and Senai, and your entire family and friends, constantly in our thoughts and forever in our prayers, until we meet again. Happy birthday. Nindigikwe, Wudinya game. Mom, and I visit his grave all the time. I take flowers, I visit his grave, I go to his house. But uh, something that really I really appreciate and I love is seeing Fidel's family, particularly Fidel's son, Alai. Mm -hmm. He's just a replica of Fidel when Fidel was that age. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I look at this boy and he behaves like Fidel. So I just, I feel, I feel happy when I see him, mm. yeah. Fidel, to, to the nation, to the world, looked like the heir apparent uh, to the Odinga dynasty, or at least like he was being groomed uh, to be that heir. Who of your children would you say um, is showing the traits of taking that over? Of course you can say Fidel probably was the heir apparent, but 
That is maybe because he was the eldest, isn't it? Mm -hmm. When you are the eldest child, you kind of lead the way. You show the way. And um, Fidel started taking the responsibility at an early age. I told you when the father was not there, he felt that was his respons responsibility to help the siblings, the younger ones, to grow. And um, we did not specify Fidel, specifically say that we want to train Fidel in this. Of course, all our children, we've trained them in the same way. They've grown up in a political home. Their father also grew up in a political home. And uh, one thing that you trained them on is that they must grow up knowing that they have their own career, depending on their dreams, what they want to choose. But whichever career that they choose, they must be the best in that career. Mm -hmm. They must try hard. Their dreams should drive them towards the career mm -hmm. of their own choice. Um, since Fidel died, where, where would you say you are emotionally? Now I understood even better the mothers who have lost their children. Because sometimes uh, when you lose somebody who is close to you like that, you get disoriented and uh, you lose focus and you feel isolated you see people and you don't see them and yet you don't you're not seeing them you hear and you don't hear and people come with sweet words they pray for you they, but it doesn't click it doesn't click but that is life that is life so I know <coughs> now I think I take my position and I take it as a responsibility to help other other mothers who have lost their children. And nothing prepares a mother for the death of her child. Just a, a word of encouragement to a mother who has stayed in that sense of disorientation, perhaps even depression, because of losing her son or her daughter. You know, these children, they are gifts from God. God gave them to us. And I believe that God somehow is in charge and even when they go we still thank God you know personally I read a lot of books I read a lot of articles about death and how to cope with this I also play a lot of music I've always loved music but I play music that encourage encourages me mm. and I will ask them to do the same in our own respective areas. We need to form some kind of support group. Away from Fidel, let's talk about you um, as the wife of this enigma, Raila Odinga. What a lot of people don't know about you and what it takes to actually uh, be the right hand person of this man, to share in his vision, to be with him during the highs and the lows, to celebrate his successes to lift him up when he feels demoralized. There's no college or institution that prepares politicians' wives. You just find yourself, you are plunged into that thing. And most of the time, you'll find that you are not even consulted and you become a politician's wife. Mm -hmm. So um, life is a bit difficult because anybody and everybody can walk it into your life and then Anybody and everybody can say anything about you, mm. whether they are right or wrong, true or false. But you must, as a person, you can draw your own, you can draw your own boundaries mm -hmm. and say beyond this, I would not go, huh? and so forth. But the most important thing is that whether you're a politician's wife or a bishop's wife or doctor's wife or whatever. Uh, if you had made a, mis a, 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 a decision to marry them, stick by them. Stick by them. And, um, but you can also talk to them. If you think they're doing something wrong, or people send you to them. Me, I get thousands of messages. Tell me what you want this, tell him this, tell him this. I also look at the messages. 
and I see which ones to say, which one to report and which one not to report. What don't a lot of people know about you? What do you love doing with your free time? Excellent dancer. <laughs> All the way from my teenage days, yeah. I dance well and I love dancing. You know these days even dance gospel music yeah. and I do dance then. <laughs> and I play music in my room, even in my room alone I play music and I dance to mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much uh, for speaking to Citizen TV and thank you for welcoming us into your lovely home. Karibu. Thank you. Come again. <laughs> <laughs> I <should. laughs>